Hi guys and welcome, Gnembon here with a video about the new updates and new features for the carpet mod. What is the carpet mod? It's a set of server modifications for vanilla Minecraft that adds tons of diagnostic and control features for technical players, mainly for mob farm designers and redstone nerds. The aim is to have a complete package allowing to quickly evaluate vanilla farm designs and have all modifications to be server side only so you can play using any vanilla compatible client like Optifine. So the carpet mod is now updated to 1.11.12, but that's just one of many exciting new features. This video will only cover what's new for the description of the previously introduced features like controlling and monitoring mob spawning or the tick command, please refer to the previous videos of the carpet mod. One definitely useful thing about tick warp command is sometimes you may start a very long warp and then you realize it was a bad idea. You can actually cancel that using tick warp zero, which will stop the warp regardless where it is. Currently we could fully control and monitor mob spawning and speed up the game, but one thing was missing to have a complete package, item counting. Obviously we can use command block contraptions to reliably count the farm drops, like my own command block counter or pandas farm stats box, but it would be awesome to be able to do it without extra setup or extra redstone circuitry, mainly to reduce the hassle of setting it up, but also extra lag that these methods incur. So I was debating how to do it the easiest and the most obvious way and I figured out that there is already a block in the game that does all these things, searches for dropped items and counts them by inventorizing them and yes, it's a hopper. And what's cool about it is it also has a built-in mechanism of getting rid of these items, simply by placing them out in the connected inventories. So what I added was simply to change its behavior slightly when it points to other type of block, namely a wool block. What it does then, it reports uh, whatever it holds in its inventory and clears it completely. This means that such a hopper will be counting all the items that end up in it, which means that it is not restricted by traditional hopper transfer limit of 9000 items per hour, but limited by a regular hopper item pickup speed which is above 570,000 items per hour, and each hopper can theoretically count up to 2.5 million items per hour from its inventory. There is also an accompany counter command to check uh, what these hoppers have collected so far. Typing slash counter, we get all the items with their speed the hopper counter have measured. Slash counter real time gives us the same statistics but based on the real time clock, not internal game ticks. Good for measuring farm drops under low TPS. And slash counter reset resets all the counters. Counting starts automatically with the first registered item and when using counter reset command, it starts the timer right away. You could also notice that the statistics were associated with the respective wool color. This means that multiple hopper pointing to the same wool color will be counting items together. Useful when you expect more than half a million items per hour or you want to count them from multiple locations at the same time. And hoppers that point to different walls will be counting items independently. So in total we can count with hopper counters on 16 different channels at the same time. Each channel can be checked and reset independently as well. There is a few new useful temporal options. First two affect fill and clone commands. Fill limit changes the default limit of filled blocks from default 32k to whatever you need, but less than 4 million blocks at this point. Fill updates, if we change it to false, will suppress block updates and tile ticks in the cockpit area for fill and clone commands. Useful for makers of slimestone creations where copying segments of flying machines was pain in the butt because of all the extra block updates it was causing. While I'm certain skipping block updates is what many people need, I'm not certain if it's generally a good idea to skip block events and when cloning with this option. So I might revert the style tick change at some point and just suppress block updates only. We'll see. How these options can be used? Let's move this ocean monument, for example, in the sky for a moment. What would you want to do is grab one corner, then grab the other, and paste where we want it to end up. But you get a warning from the game, because we have much more blocks than 32,000. So you can just adjust the fill limit option, suppress all the updates connected to it, otherwise water will simply go into fall of the area we are moving, and now we can repeat the command. As simple as that. No need to do it in an external editors, like MC Edit. 
I still think the limit for filling and cloning has their reasons, like preventing us from wiping off accidentally a large area because we put cords in the wrong way, but I thought it would be cool if we could sometimes control the default behavior a little bit more. There is also a push limit, temporal, that temporarily changes the push limit for pistons, from 4 to 256 blocks. Initially I thought that it would go too much beyond vanilla game rules, but Il Mango had a good point. When designing redstone contraptions, we typically start loosely and then compact to get a smaller contraption with the same functionality at the end. But that's not that easy from Slimestoners, where 12 blocks push limit was a very hard constraint. With this temporal, you can temporarily increase it, come up with a contraption and then minimize the design to fit under the 12 block push limit. There is a new command, unload, which simulates periodic chunk unloading and reports to the operator the list of chunks that will be scheduled for unloading next save cycle. Useful for determining the order in that sequence of a particular chunk of interest. Interesting observation to be made. In the nether there are typically many chunks loaded not by the player, but the random lava pockets at the edges of the chunk checking for fire spread around them in not yet loaded chunks. Disabling fire tick prevents them from loading these few extra chunks. Hmm, this means that we can chunk load using lava. All the commands should now have a full command block support. Previously, I didn't think it was necessary for all commands, like the pink carpet or the spawn list command, but I got an interesting question from Eddie, asking, if we push the raised trapdoor with a piston, does the collision box of the moved trapdoor blocks a spawn attempt of a witch in a witch hut? The fact is it doesn't do it when it's retracted, and it doesn't when it's extended, but piston extension has an in-between stage where the trapdoor is like in the middle of the block and should in theory collide with a witch attempting to spawn in this spot. So what happens here, I run the input through a monostable to both the piston pushing the trapdoor and the common block checking for spawnless in that particular spot. And we can see we go no for one tick to prove that the hitbox of the block 36 is accurately reflecting the state of the trapdoor. Because if we place the trapdoor on the side, now the witch can spawn during any tick of this sequence. There was one inconsistency I have fixed while estimating spawn statistics when multiple players are in more than one dimension at the same time. So let's start track spawning. Let's hang around for a while, spawn a few mobs. The new estimates for spawn rates are now calculated based on the absolute world tick time, not the number of times the spawning algorithm has been called. This also meant I needed to separate overall spawn statistics for each dimension to indicate what happened in the other dimensions with other players accurately reporting spawns and spawn chances in each dimension separately. Now we can move to the nether for a few seconds. And now if you read the respawn report, you can see that we have overworld and other statistics displayed separately indicating different total time spent in each dimension, with average number of mobs per tick, percentages of full mob caps, failed spawn cycles where no mobs have spawned, and successful spawn cycles when at least one mob have spawned, and also average number of spawned mobs in each spawning cycle. The list of mobs is shared between all the dimensions and spawns are computed using a server internal tick clock, so should now report correctly, in terms of timing. At the end, one word about a hidden feature from the previous update, Chorus Flower Teleportation while flying Elytra to get the height boost. This will be removed from 1.11.2 version of this mod, because we have now rockets to boost the Elytra. But I wanted just to talk a little bit why I think this was a good idea to use Chorus Fruit mechanics in this case. First reason is simple, it wasn't that overpowered comparing to the bow and now the rockets, as the teleportation would stop you in place for a moment, but it was still doing the job. Second reason is that it was finally giving her some reason to use and farm Chorus Flute, one of many underused items in the game. Third, the actual implementation of the mechanics I think was quite clever. It would teleport you randomly around 30 blocks above your head while making sure that a player could actually teleport to that location and continue its flight. The teleportation was limited to the world limit height, unlike the rockets nowadays, which may lead to abuse, as they can lift you up indefinitely into the skies. And the last argument, since the chorus fruit is abundant in the end, that would also mean that you would always have means to eat, heal and go back home, providing you still have your elytra, regardless how deeply you get lost in the end. 
but since the Moyang implemented the Elytra boost using rockets, well I think using Chorus Fruit was a much more balanced solution, comparing to how overpowered are the rockets at the moment, I don't think it was necessary to keep this in the mod at this point. So that's it for today. The mod patch files link is in the description, and as previously the patch is for server files only. But in case you had some troubles installing the mod or using it with your single player world, I included a separate unlisted video you can find in the description with me going through the installation process step by step, so you can use it as a guide in case you run into problems with installing this mod. At the end, I hope you enjoyed the video and the new additions to the carpet mod, and if so, don't forget to leave a like, drop me a comment in the downer and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already, and see you in the next one, bye bye!